E benim yapacağım bir şey var mı şimdi artık? Evet. Moderatör henüz bağlanmadı. Miguel, Miguel. Ah, Miguel, Miguel is here. Yeah, my friend is here. Gördüm. Hi my friend, how are you doing? Hello, hello my friend, how are you doing? It's Fine, great thanks. to see you. <laughs> to see you one second because I'm trying to, you know, the. Hi, or how are you? Hi, 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 my dear friend. How are you doing? Nice to see you. Not too bad. Uh, I, I apologize. I'm a couple of minutes late. I, I was just coming back from the hospital. I see. How's I everything? See. How is Turkey? Not bad. Up to now, we, you know, we are struggling with Corona as you, everyone in the same situation. It looks stable up to now, but I, we yeah. don't know what's going on this next month. Mm. Let's let's hope things settle down. Has Miguel Erez joined yet? Hello, yes, my Miguel is here. Ah, oh, Miguel, how are you? Good to see you. Uh, Ramesh is stuck in a in a uh, faculty meeting in his uh, in his hospital, and he's saying he's going to take a little while, so he might join in 15-20 minutes. So you can carry on. You can start, actually, my friend. Excellent. So, uh, Salman, uh, um, what will be the the order? How how do you plan the the webinar, you will make the introduction, right? Uh, no problem. As, uh, you know, you do it. You're the moderator, so you carry on. I'm just going to sit and enjoy. 
so so you you will you will start right make the introduction to sure. Google to okay. okay no no so uh, and i I'm grateful. Um, um, thank you, Miguel. A pleasure to have you again uh, with us. And you know, you've always supported these webinars, and I'm grateful. Uh, you've, you've been great all along. Um, today we have with us uh, the world famous uh, white matter dissection ex expert, who's done probably the most number of white matter dissection in the world. Um, he's got amazing numbers. He's got a brilliant faculty. He's got uh, an amazing lab, and the work he does and surgeries he does is. Uh, uh, it's very difficult to match that, and I'm, you know, he is masters of the masters. Um, it's it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Ugotore, who's a dear friend, a brother for many many years, uh, and he's um, really helped uh, lots of neurosurgeons around the world regarding how to operate in brain. So here we go, Tore. It's all yours. Okay. So thank you very much, it's dear, my dear friend Salman and my dear friend Miguel. It's great pleasure for me to be part of this uh, webinar. I like to thank Pakistan Society of Neurosurgeons also for this organization. Uh, of course, to you and to Miguel. Uh, I have my slides here and um, now can you see my slides perfectly well my friend Miguel, you can see my slides perfectly well yeah so uh, my talk about the white matter dissection and uh, which is uh, it is my hobby in neurosurgery. Just one second. Yeah. And again, I thank you for this uh, organization and I am very grateful to be part of this uh, webinar. The white matter consists of mostly glial cells and myelinated and unmyelinated axons that transmit signals uh, from one region to other region. And 50% of human brain volume is white matter and an estimated 160,000 kilometer of myelinated fibers course within the white matter. These are what we know up to now. But it is interesting. Sorry. The percentage of myelinated fibers we are still, we don't know. We have our knowledge about the white matter is very limited. In this modern era, we are still uh, doesn't know how brain is working and how the white matter is working. Imagine, we don't know what is the percentage of myelinated fibers in the white matter. In this condition, as a neurosurgeon, my goal to be as less traumatic as possible when we perform brain surgery. Of course, when we open the dura, we are damaging something, of course, but we should not destroy. This is the point. So we have to respect the white matter. At the end of this uh, decade, can you imagine after some information about white matter? Now, this is our point. Now. We are almost thinking that white matter does not matter. I do not agree with this. We should respect, especially the neocortex, and we should not uh, damage the brutal damage to white matter. This is my goal in my talk. White matter dissection started in 17th century with Raymond Visions and French anatomist, and he first time demonstrated pyramidal tractus, and first time demonstrated pont pontine, transverse pontine fibers. And also he described how we can perform this dissection. And then another important step is the uh, Christian Rail, German uh, anatomist. He find out that alcohol, you, you can work with the alcohol fixed brains. 
this is the this uh, uh, anatomy is open new era in neuroanatomy because before him there were no fixation method so he introduced the alcohol to fix the brain and the, all the anatomic information in 19th century coming after this development and there are many anatomists that contribute to white matter anatomy the yellow ones for me the most important ones but these are the major anatomists introduced the white matter dissection but the development of uh, microtom and histological techniques this method was neglected this is Dejerin, and he introduced uh, this new technology and all anatomists work on histological techniques and they neglect it. They forget the uh, white matter di uh, dissection. And Klingler in uh, Switzerland, uh, in Basel, where he was the also teacher of Professor Yashargin, was the last, last best uh, fiber dissection anatomist. And he published his book 1956. And I was lucky enough to see his specimens in 1991 in Basel Anatomy Museum in the corner. And I saw his specimens and I tried to simulate. I tried to understand what was it. And then this is one of his specimens. It took one week to understand for me to this dissection at that time. And I knew that Professor Yashargil also uh, dissected uh, brain and he uh, guided me in this aspect of uh, anatomic dissections. And I was happy to do dissections. And there were no interest at that time. Uh, I gave many lectures and 10 years, nobody were interested. And it was just my hobby. And I had difficulty to publish these articles also. I uh, recommend for neuro young neurosurgeons to understand the brain and at least to understand how complex it is and to understand that we have to respect as much as possible. And I'm very happy now that fiber tractography came out in 2000 and now the beautiful fiber tractographies are available. And then the fiber dissection is now well accepted all over the world. I never thought 30 years ago that someday I can give a lecture about white matter and I am very happy today that I am talking. And this is our first fiber dissection course with Professor Yashagi. Uh, now, the, the, I will talk about the general anatomy of the white matter. This is, I will not go to detail, there is no time for also, just the concept. First of all, the Maynard classified the white matter system in three group, association, homosexual, and projection. Association fibers are ipsi hemispheric, interconnect the cortical areas within each hemisphere. Commissural fibers are bihemispheric and interconnect the similar cortical areas between opposite hemispheres. And then projection fibers, again ipsi hemispheric, crossing in the lower brain stem interconnects the cortical areas with the deep nuclei, brainstem, cerebellum, and spinal cord. This is the main three groups of white matter. And now we are able to put a different color in the MR tractography to demonstrate this fiber system in the white matter. The association fibers are, can be long association or short association fibers. The short association fibers are U fibers or arcuate fibers, just under the cortex. And U fibers are originated from the sulcal surface of the cortex and interconnect the neighboring gyri. And a little deeper, it can connect with other gyri. So these are U fibers. And then we have long association fibers. This is uh, arcuate fibers, tractography. And long association fibers, uh, for example, superior longitudinal fasciculus interconnects almost all lobes, the frontal, parietal, occipital, and temporal, just like a C-shape surrounding the sylvian fissure. 
and we can demonstrate the uh, superior longitudinal fasciculus. Even we can put a different uh, um, segments of superior uh, longitudinal fasciculus. And then extreme capsule is also white metal fiber. It looks like extreme capsule is wrong terminology, but I cannot change it. Extreme capsule is not like internal capsule or external capsule. Extreme capsule is the mainly interconnect insula with the uh, neighboring operculi. So the anterior part insula connects with the front orbital operculum and the, the superior uh, part connect the frontoparietal operculum and inferior part connects with the temporal operculum. The main bulk of the extreme capsule is the U fibers, but in the depth, uncinate and front occipital fasciculus also partially within the extreme capsule. And uncinate fasciculus, another long association fibers, just in the limen insula region, interconnect front orbital region with the temporal pole. And we can easily demonstrate it, it uh, with the uh, fiber tractography. This is coronal picture, and you can see. It. Then front occipital fasciculus interconnect frontal region with the occipital, temporal and occipital. In this uh, limen insula region, front occipital fasciculus is almost together with the uncinate fasciculus. You cannot separate it. Uh, they are together, but in the Posterior part, the front occipital fasciculus joins the sagittal stratum, just medial to inferior arm of superior longitudinal fasciculus. This is front occipital fasciculus. You can see that interconnects frontal with the insula and then the temporal and occipital. And the inferior longitudinal fasciculus are interconnected next the temporal pole with the occipital and it's running within the fusiform gyrus and inferior temporal gyrus this is another association fibers and we can also demonstrate this uh, fiber system with the different color this information is very very valuable especially with preoperative uh, planning of surgery singulum also, the main uh, association system of limbic system from subcallosal area, and it's within the cingulate gyrus, and then going backward and then down within the hypocampal, uh, 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 hypocampal gyrus and connects the amygdala. So, this is like a C shape uh, system running within the uh, cingulate and parahypocampal gyrus. And you can demonstrate this C-shaped structure in the tractography. And fimbria and fornix also. You know, this is pes hippocampi. Fimbria in the medial side and going backward. And the name is fornix now. The term. And then body of fornix, column of fornix, and mammillary body. This is also another uh, association system of the limbic lobe. And this is also, we can demonstrate it. Commissural fibers cross the midline and interconnect the two hemispheres. The biggest and largest commissural system is the corpus callosum, as you well know. So these fibers interconnect two hemispheres. And callosal fibers running laterally, but in this, uh, Centrum semiovale region, uh, we cannot follow well. Even with the tractography, we don't well, we cannot follow well. We don't know exact relation with the projection fibers and callosal fibers, how they are running in the centrum semiovale. This is not uh, still uh, well known. And callosal fibers, actually the callosal fibers connect also lower part, but in the tractography, standard tractography, we cannot demonstrate it. Anterior commissure is another uh, commissural system, just in the uh, anterior to fornix. In the midline, we can see very small structure, but in the laterally, it can connect the whole temporal area. You see the anterior commissure joins to the sagittal stratum. 
And in this is superior view. This is left side for Amano Monroe. This is anterior commissure and going laterally in the very uh, uh, um, dense bundle. And then coming laterally, and then some fibers goes anterior, and most of them going posterior joins to sagittal stratum. And we can demonstrate it also with the tractography. An hippocampal commissure between two fornix, just underneath the splenium, there is a commissural fibers, but in human, this commissure is not well demonstrated. We cannot, dem I, at least I cannot demonstrate very well. But in the uh, animals, we can see this uh, commissural stem. We can call it hippocampal commissure or, or uh, fornicial commissure. And projection fibers connect the cerebral cortex with the subcortical regions. Corona radiata, internal capsule, and the uh, curus cerebri, and it goes down, and corticospinal tract goes down, and this is pyramid, and then also corticobulbar and corticopontine uh, fibers are running in the pedunculus, and this is projection system, corona radiata, internal capsule. And this is medial view of the corona radiata and internal capsule. And in the brainstem also, we can demonstrate the medial lemniscus. And in the motor corticospinal tract within the pons, you see in the, within the pons, they have some uh, segments and then they came together and then they join in the pyramid of medloblongata. And then cerebellar peduncles also, superior, middle, and inferior cerebellar peduncles also visible, different color. And today we can also put the functional MRI together with the tractography. It's improving. It is still primitive, but our knowledge about white matter is very limited. This is the main problem. The problem is not coming from the tractography. The problem is coming, our knowledge of white matter is limited. But in the next decade, the next generation, should be much, much better neurosurgeon because the seven Tesla is coming. We cannot uh, skip, we cannot uh, manipulate anything. We have to be much better neurosurgeons. This is from Cardiff University. Look at this. This is unbelievable detail in the white matter of the brain. It's available, it's coming. Just the point, we have to respect. We don't have right to cut normal brain. There is no silent brain. Just we don't hear very well today. We should respect it. So this technology is not it doesn't show us that we have to put a tube to brain. We should respect this brain. This technology can help us. In, we gave many lectures. I gave many lectures and many courses and now all over the world. And sometimes some colleagues after the course, they ask me, okay, it's very nice to do dissection, but why we are learning this? Why we are dissecting this? It is interesting question. <laughs> Still, I have a difficulty to answer. <laughs> but first of all, why I spent 30 years with biomedical? Just to respect. Brain is very complex and we should preserve normal tissue as much as possible. This is the key. And then with the tractography, it's helping me for my preoperative planning. And also in the post-operative tractography three months later, showing me how was my surgery, more or less, it is examination for me. So I enjoyed to use tractography before and after surgery. For example, this case, five years old girl, left-sided slight hemiparesis. 
where is this tumor? What is the origin of this tumor? It's very difficult to tell. It's very difficult. It looks like internal capsule, but the, he, he, she is not a hemiplegic. She has some slight hemiparesis. So I have to understand origin of this tumor. Otherwise I cannot operate this. Uh, otherwise I cannot decide my surgical approach. And even with this limited tractography, left is left always. Look at this sensory system pushed medial. This is tumor. Sensory system means internal capsule pushed medial. So this is not internal capsule tumor. I don't, I didn't see internal capsule tumor, to be honest, in the pyramidal tractus tumor. There is no pyramidal tractus tumor. And then motor fibers push backward and medially. Even we cannot follow it at that time, the technology. But I know it's moving there. But if it's cut, it, this is artifact. But I know it's there. So what, what can be the location of this tumor? This tumor is globus pallidus tumor. It's very, very rare tumor. Globus pallidus. This is putamen. This is whole internal capsule. This is sublentiform portion, posterior limb, anterior limb, putamen, anterior commissure, and globus pallidus in the depth of the putamen just superior to uh, anterior commissure. The tumor is originating from posterior globus pallidus. If I understand this, I can operate, but it's also difficult. How I can approach the globus pallidus? There is no way to go globus pallidus without cutting something. But if you remember the MRI, just one second. Anyway, I like to show the MRI again. The tumor came to the almost surface in the sylvian vallecula. You see, it follows the lenticular striated arteries. So, so tumor almost came to the sylvian vallecula. So for me to come from sylvian vallecula, follow the lenticular striated is the only way to go there. Just follow the lenticular straits. Following the lenticular straits is very dangerous, yes, but there is no way to go there. So this is surgical with your right side. You see lenticular strait. This is M1. And just follow the lenticular straits because tumor already open way to me. So I follow it. And this is after removal. These are lenticular straits. These are lenticular straight arteries. And they are intact. And this is postoperative MRI. Look at this. This is anterior globus pallidus. This is posterior globus pallidus. Putamen is intact. Posterior globus pallidus tumor, internal capsule is intact. So this information was important for me to, to get this tumor. You see, I follow the lenticular streets from here and remove the, this tumor just here. And the sensory and motor fibers are almost intact. This is postoperative tractography. And this is early postoperative picture. Interesting, histopathology was not clear. And even we sent the most famous neuropathologist and he told us that PNET, it is most malignant tumor. And we gave radiation to this girl. And she is now totally intact, now 11 years. So the diagnosis was wrong. I am very sorry. It must be phylostigas. Astrocytoma. I feel guilty, but the histopathology told, told us PNET. So, but anyway, no recurrence 11 years later. This is not possible. In PNET, this is not possible. Anyway, so it was possible to remove it.
Another case, whole hippocampal tumor to preserve normal anatomy. So if you go from here, I, I, should, not, I should stop my talk. So we should respect this brain. This is temporal neocortex. Right side or left side, dominant side or non-dominant, doesn't matter. We should respect the normal brain. This tumor is always in the hippocampus and parahippocampal gyrus. They don't go here. And we have to remove just the tumor. And in this case, the best way is the supracerebellar transtentorial approach and to preserve all this structure, just to remove the mediobasal temporal region. This is right side and cutting tentorium. Tumor is hanging here, you see? And without cutting anything, we remove it. This is after resection and on endoscopic view. This is uh, choroid plexus. This is inferior temporal arteries. And this is internal capsule from back. And this is third nerve. And amygdala was removed. And this is anterior choroidal artery. And it was removed. And this is endoscope also important. And you see, I came from here to remove just selectively the whole uh, tumor. And the so-called temporal stem is intact which is temporal stem is not anatomic term, it is wrong term, but another story. And this is early postoperative. And similar case, but it goes up to the here, the uh, precuneus also. In the same, you see the sensory and motor fibers are laterally, moved laterally, and this Tumor is important. This is, the tumors are not following the fiber tracks easily. Tumors are following the same uh, CETA architecture or mile architecture of the system. This is hippocampocentric part of mesocortex. And this is olfactocentric part of mesocortex. So tumors are following these rules, not simply fiber system. And I just combine uh, paramedian supracerebellar and posterior interimspheric and remove the old tumor. Combine approach in the same session to craniotomy, semi sitting position. I cannot do without semi sitting position. And this is after resection, preform cortex to middle cingulate gyrus. And just to remove the tumor, remove the tumor and preserve the pyramidal tractus laterally. And this is sensory and motor fiber, but just lateral to tumor. They pushed. And this is postoperative visual effect. And it was diffuse astrocytoma. Another case, thalamic tumor. Thalamic tumor never invade the internal capsule, fortunately. And their vascularization is totally different. So this is great chance for us. So the thalamic tumor, left-sided, big thalamic tumor, left-sided, even it goes down, but it's herniation. It doesn't invade the midbrain. It doesn't invade the midbrain. It just herniate, push down to midbrain. This is herniation, but it is left thalamic tumor, but sensory and motor fibers always push laterally in the all of thalamic tumors. And this is a great chance for us to stop there. And this is best way to go is the, for me, in this case, lateral ventricular surface, anterior transcallosal approach, just go there and then remove the tumor from here. And I can get the, also the inferior part of the, uh, this tumor. And sensory and motor fibers, again, intact lateral tumor. So this, Give me some idea, midbrain. I have five minutes more, I think, Dr. Salman, isn't it? You can take as much as you want because Ramesh is I don't want to uh, talk too much, but uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I, no, it's I, fun. I, we're, in, we're enjoying okay. your. Uh, okay. Uh, and another case. This is midbrain, midbrain gliomas. I I have now glioma fifty cases with the midbrain, just glioma, 
and they are they have, they are following some order. I don't have crus cerebri tumor glioma. I have crus cerebri cavernoma. I have metastasis, but not glioma. It's interesting. Tegmentum tumors or tectum tumors. Even in tectum tumors, it's coming from one corner. In the tegmentum, it never goes other side. So they are not stupid. The tumors are following some anatomic orders. They are not chaotic. They are following some orders. And this is right tegmentum tumor. She has a, he has a, some hemiparesis. This is right side. And I don't have a thalamopedincular tumor also. Thalamo, pedincular tumor, thalamus doesn't go each other. It's a little confusion, in my opinion. And sensory and motor fibers. You see some of them anterior, some of them posterior, but lateral side is open. So I can come from lateral. So this gives me some idea. So I have to do before surgery. I have to study this. And this tractography also, I have to do myself. Otherwise, tractography has a billions of information, but can give you confusion. So we have to pick up what information we need from tractography. And then the cerebellar peduncle, superior cerebellar peduncle, push backward. So I can go, the tumor is originating from here, so I can go from laterally. So I can go subtemporal, which many surgeons uh, use it, but I don't like to use the subtemporal to go midbrain because you have to retract the temporal lobe. Even if you drill the bone, even you have to. But instead of, I like to use supracerebellar because with the CSF, when you release CSF, the cerebellum went down, so you can reach the same area. Uh, with the supracerebellar approach. And I prefer semi-sitting position, but this patient has a cardiac septal defect, so I use lateral. But in two minutes, I am there. So, anyway. This is after resection. This is lateral way to go midbrain. And sensory and motor fibers are almost intact after surgery. And the superior cerebellar peduncle also in normal position. It was pylomyxoid astrocytoma. This is an interesting case for me. This he had a four times VP shunt placement, uh, and then but Tirman's history of ataxia, dysmetria, vomiting. This patient needs something. But when I looked this, I said I cannot operate. Flare MRI is very dangerous. We have to be careful. We cannot take it out what we see in the flare. This is not glioma surgery. This can be uh, liver surgery. So please keep in your mind. Flare images, sometimes very helpful, shows the exact border, but sometimes it's just confused, like this case. In this case, it looks like whole midbrain and pons is tumor. And look at this. I couldn't understand what can I do everywhere. But look at this tractography. Superior cerebellar peduncle is pushed laterally and anterior, totally intact. I never seen that superior cerebellar peduncle is involved with the tumor. Somehow they, they go somewhere, fortunately. And sensory and motor fibers, even not well demonstrated, but they pushed anterior. So I can operate this. Ulo tonsillary approach. Look at this, three months later, midbrain is totally intact. I didn't give anything. Just remove the tumor and look at this. In the previous preoperative MRI, it looks like whole midbrain was tumor. All midbrain was a diffuse tumor. No. And superior cerebellar peduncle is totally normal. This is middle cerebellar. This is inferior cerebellar peduncles. And sensory and motor fibers are normal. And it was a pandemoma. Another case, it looks like 
diffuse spontane glioma. Five years old. Look at this. First of all, this is not spontane. This is medulloblongata tumor. Medulloblongata tumors stay in medulloblongata. They don't go to pons. I have one case is that it is like a multifocal GVM. It is another story. But 95% is like they follow the order. This is medulloblongata tumor, not pontine tumor. And medulloblongata tumor stay one side, left or right. So this is right medulloblongata tumor. Sensory and motor fibers, you see, pushed other side almost. But they are that because the patient is walking. I mean, she is not quadriplegic. And this is after resection. It was medulloblongata tumor. This is now 10 years after. Medulloblongata is almost intact. This is not tumor. This is 10 years after. Uh, and it's still this color. But it was pilostic astrocytoma. Now she's a big lady. The last case, again, it looks like whole medulloblongata is tumor here. But again, I told you, medulloblongata tumors stay in one side. And this is young um, student in medical school. And it looks like whole medulloblongata tumor, but not. If you see this, there is some border. And if you look at here, Tumor. Some part is with contrast, some not. Again, sensory fibers interrupted. We couldn't show at that time. Now we can show much better, but it's there. It's going anteriorly. And motor is interrupted, but it's moved anteriorly. And the cerebellar peduncles, inferior cerebellar, we couldn't show well because of the tumor's uh, effect. But this is prone position. Look, this is right-sided medulloblongata. This is midline. Left medulloblongata is here. So this is right medulloblongata tumor. And this is after resection. You see, left medulloblongata, it came back. It's in normal. So it was, it's growing some portion from the, some part of medulloblongata. And this is after resection. And this is now, now she's the same MRI is still doing that. This, what is this? I don't think it is tumor because now I operated her 12 years ago and it's st still same. Whatever. And the sensory fibers are almost intact and the motor fibers are almost intact. And the postoperative, the right inferior cerebellar, we couldn't demonstrate. I think I damaged it. And she was not able to stand in one foot in the early post-operative, but later on, she is totally intact. It was diffuse astrocytoma. We are just following, we don't give any radiation or chemotherapy. I think 14 years ago, I operated her. Uh, the complex structures of the brain uh, can be more clearly demonstrated and understand uh, when the fiber dissection technique is used and and it is i think valuable information uh, it can give us and fiber tractography also promising technique and it's developing every day and with the seven tesla mri tractography i look forward to see uh, really we have to be more careful surgeon there is no way and it, it we, we will be more respectful neurosurgeon and I think the revival of the fiber dissection technique and in incorporation, incorporation with the neurosurgical education for treating patients uh, is a topic for consideration. I strongly recommend young uh, residents to play with the brain white matter to understand at least the, how complex is the brain. And, this way we can respect more and we always uh, perform this course in istanbul but we couldn't manage it this year because of the corona but every june we are 
organizing course with the live surgery. Thank you for your attention. It's great pleasure for me to be part of this webinar. Thank you, my friends. Professor Miguel. Thank you very much, Salman. Well, uh, Professor Ture, congratulations again for this wonderful talk. I think that uh, there are uh, many messages we can take from this uh, wonderful presentation. I think many of uh, them just uh, regarding the, the youngest colleagues in, in the audience, because once again, uh, once again your salary has to, to move forward and has to move forward in every young colleague career uh, on the hands of uh, anatomical lab uh, work. I think this is a, a wonderful uh, demonstration about uh, what we can do at the lab and the way this knowledge must be you know, used at the operating room for the best uh, outcome and best surgical result of our patient. Congratulations. And uh, I'd like, maybe be, before we have several, several questions from, from the audience, I, I'd like to, to make a, a couple of questions to Professor Ugur Ture. Uh, one, one question, basically. Uh, do you have, I think, one of the main, talking about supratentorial region, I think one of the main concerns in the deepest uh, areas is uh, the possibility of damage of the lenticular striate arteries. Do you have any trick? Do you have any a special consideration to avoid such a, a, you know, harmful damage for our patients? For supracerebellar transtentorial approach, or what, which approach you are asking? I mean, at the supratentorial uh, region. Uh, ah, I uh, see, I see. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, on, oh, yeah. Second, I, Even, I can... you know, I showed the extreme case that I follow the lenticular straight. Yeah. This is the, we have to preserve the lenticular. There is no excuse for it. And we have to open the sylvian fissure. This is what I do. Without opening sylvian fissure, without seeing carotis, without seeing A1, M1, without seeing middle cerebral trunks, I, and then I have to see lenticular straits. Without opening this area nicely, I cannot guarantee for my preservation. So I have to open it. And then I have to respect, of course, but if you see it, if you see origin of lenticular straits, you, you, it's not easy to destroy it. You know, <laughs> if you don't see it, if you don't know where is it, you can easily destroy it. But if you know where is it, this is the main point. Uh, and then second point, you have to try to be as nice as possible uh, using microsurgical technique, without microscope, without uh, micro instruments, uh, I I don't know how you can handle it. Without opening Sylvia Fisher, I cannot handle it. Okay. Um, and Professor Torre, the question I was going to ask is, what would you trust more, your um, DTI that you see there, your own um, anatomy that you see on the brain, or maybe functional MRI, or maybe monitoring? What would you um, uh, trust the maximum of, of all these modalities? I mean, I think I have one slide more. Uh, sorry. I have one specific slide for this question. I can show you. So there are many modalities today. Last two decades, at least I am practicing last two decades. And in this time, these modalities came. And I love all of them. And I have all of them. If something is new, I am trying to have it as soon as possible. But I cannot trust any of them. I can, these are help for my surgery, but these cannot control my surgery. You know, it look, it's nice to have this information together with the, my also understanding of anatomy, also 
correct indication and correct surgical approach and microsurgical technique. We should put all together. All of them are important, but none of them is enough. Only anatomy. No, it's not enough. It just start. <laughs> you can just start, but not enough. You need much more. That's okay. Well, uh, um, Professor Ture, I have a, another comment. I very much uh, enjoy your inf apparently infiltrated cases at the brainstem and the way you have been, let's say, calling, you, you have been calling the attention about MRI and the way MRI can be sometimes misleading and just giving, giving the impression that some lesion is uh, uh, basically intrinsic, uh, that is to say, non amenable for removal, but actually you have shown wonderful cases in which you made a, a, a wonderful uh, gross uh, total removal. I think this is uh, important, or one of the, what the important conclusion at the infratentorial uh, region surgery. And I like also to have seen very clearly how you give uh, importance in, you know, in the same comment, in the same way of uh, uh, Salman Shari was uh, commenting. And uh, I'd like to know your opinion about spectroscopy, because uh, to me, spectroscopy is also very misleading. Very frequently, you have the report from a neuroradiologist that is a malignant glioma, so mm -hmm. surgery doesn't have any, any, any place, any role. But if you go in a young patient trying to make a gross removal and so, you realize that the lesion actually is pilocytic astrocytoma or even some other, not even uh, tumoral, uh, tumoral lesion. What is your impression about the rea reability, reliability of uh, spectroscopy? I totally agree with you. You know, I use it, as I told you, I don't trust any of them. It's just giving me some idea. And many times it's giving me wrong idea. I do not operate diffuse pontine glioma. Diffuse pontine glioma is another story. But others, midbrain tumors and uh, medulloblongata tumors, and also there are pilostic astrocytomas of pons also, and they all uh, use uh, suitable for surgical resection. Even intraoperative MRI doesn't help. Even today, it doesn't help me. Even, you know, if I showed you my previous cases, if I performed intraoperative MRI, it looks like I uh, give, I put the residual tumor, but three months later, the picture is totally different. You know, even intraoperative MRI doesn't tell us truth. So we have to be careful. And we have to understand what is the origin of tumor? Most important factor for me. They are from one corner. I'm not talking about the uh, glomatosis cerebri, but they are rare, fortunately. But tumors are growing some co from some corner and grows, uh, uh, follow the some um, order from anatomy. So if I understand this, I don't care grade one or grade four. If I can help, if I can remove, I can help the patient, small help or big help or whatever. But uh, also this spectroscopy is uh, another story that it gave very wrong uh, opinions many times. This I totally agree with you. I think this is important because uh, we don't have to be dogmatic uh, in, in that point because otherwise, uh, because if, if, if so, we can, you know, miss uh, the possibility to, to help the, the patient. Well, uh, as, uh, as, uh, customary in webinars arranged by the Pakistan Society of Neurosurgery and our very good friend, Professor Sharif, we have uh, among us world-class neurosurgeons. I've seen over there, Professor Atul Goel, maybe you, you want to make some comment. I salute you and I give you my very best regard from Malaga, Spain, my friend. Atul, you can you can unmute your micro. Yes, and he's unmuted. Can, yeah. can, 
Can me can you hear me? Yes, very well. See, I have heard several lectures from Ugur, and I have seen several fiber dissections in my life, but this was one very fantastic teaching session that I have seen today. And for the young neurosurgeons, we have to know, and what he has said, that first thing is that we have to know the anatomy. And anatomy is not just frontal brain, temporal brain, corpus callosum, it is the fiber dissection, which is the newest thing, because the MRI is showing us now all the fiber tracks and also to correlate the, what MRI and fiber tracks are showing, we have to, there is no way out. If we are to do intraaxial brain tumor surgery, we have to know the fiber, how the fibers go and all kinds of fiber tracks in a very fantastic three-dimensional and that can never be learned unless you actually do the dissection. So this is one point that Dr. Ture has said. Second thing he has said is it is not just anatomy. It is the understanding of the tumor. It is the understanding of the needs of the patient and understanding how to do the dissection. So these, can, these are lessons which are absolutely important. You see, it is a neurosurgery is not just a simple game. We are dealing with the most beautiful organ of the brain, most wonderful organ of the brain. We must know, and we must know it very well that we can damage the person, we can harm the person, we can create hemiplegia, we can create big damage to the person. So when to operate, how to operate, understanding the anatomy. So we have to work very hard in neurosurgery. We have to really work hard and have all the amenities at our hand. And this is what the lesson Dr. Ture has given to all, to every young or old, to anyone. I think Dr. Ture, you have done a one, one of the most beautiful dissections through several years. I have been watching your dissections and reading your articles on fiber tracks. And we have also doing number of these kind of dissections in my own department, as you know. Yeah. And I can tell you that fantastic. Today's, you, I have heard several lectures of yours. This today's lecture was one of your absolutely best. And I'm grateful to Salman to organize this and to teach me and to everyone this kind of beautiful work from today. Thank you very much, Salman. Very welcome. Here are two. Miguel. Yeah, it's it's really it was the best compliment I ever had because I know how you are critic and how you can tell what you are thinking. You <laughs> you cannot uh, forgive anything. To listen such a comment from you was the greatest honor for me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have been, you know, Miguel, Salman, you. We have grown up together from childhood to adulthood, to now to a different level where we are, we have plateaued now, but we have to go further up in the upper direction. Exactly. We cannot, exactly. We cannot go. So we no. have to just listen to each other and learn from each exactly. other and go further up. Our, we cannot plateau. This is, exactly. the, this is the thing. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for, this, for this example, but I'm afraid my good friend, I'm still at the kindergarten, but trying to... <laughs> <laughs> okay, just another um, uh, question, uh, Ore. Uh, my, my question is regarding from young neurosurgeons' perspective. Uh, you know, you, you have been doing this for now decades, but, you know, to get to your expertise that you're able to differentiate which patients you can take out your com completely, which you cannot. So how long does it take? What, how they should start from, for example, somebody starting out who's just recently graduated, starting out, how should they do this and how should they go up? When do you think they can know which uh, patients to operate and which not to operate? Yeah. This is a difficult question. Uh, even every day I am learning. <laughs> uh, first of all, especially during residency, they should not try to finish residency as soon as possible and go out to get the money from the patient. The neurosurgery, six years residency is nothing. I started education after you know the six years. I spent five years in the laboratory. Okay, I'm not a very clever guy, so I need more time. <laughs> but they should spend one year minimum in the laboratory. 
even in my department, my residence now, I just put them to the laboratory and I told them, okay, don't go out. Even I will not ask anything to them. They have to sit down and take and work 24 hours. You know, the anatomy study, they cannot do only evening time or something. They have to start in the morning and they have to sit down in the laboratory. And at least one year they have to sit down in the laboratory and try to dissect cadavers. I know it's difficult to find cadavers, but it's always difficult. It was always difficult. So we have to find some solution and there are some solutions now. They have to spend time in the laboratory. They should not go immediately try to do most difficult surgery. This is what I learned. And then they have to start with easy cases. They should not jump with the most difficult one. Because if you uh, had a bad complication in early age, you cannot go further. You, you can uh, lose your courage. But the, our courage should not be exceed more than our capability, our, capa our capacity, our environment, equipment. So courage and, uh, you know, we should be very careful. To be very courage is not good. I was lucky because I am still training with Professor Yashargil and he is controlling what I am doing every day. <laughs> I cannot, <laughs> he's controlling. And we are discussing uh, before surgery, after surgery, and I am still learning. And they should be careful, especially for uh, difficult cases. They should not uh, jump immediately and they should spend minimum one year in the laboratory. And then they should visit other surgeons, not only their teacher, they should see other people all over the world. There are very good neurosurgeons. I can see here, they should see other nurse surgeons and they have to learn from other surgeons. I didn't learn everything only from Professor Yashagi. He is my main teacher, but I learned from many, many other neurosurgeons, especially, of course, Professor El Mefti. Uh, so I recommend them to visit other neurosurgeons, visit other departments. We can learn, it, not only correcting, sometimes we can learn what is wrong, <laughs> even. Agree. I think that another question I wanted to ask, you know, um, whenever I've come to, I've seen you um, discuss the case beforehand with the radiologist, with Professor Yashagal, and then you sit down and see which nerve is coming in, where is the vessel, where is the artery, where is the vein, and you know exactly um, you know, what problems you can give beforehand instead of getting in there. And So that discussion beforehand is the most important. Before surgery, I, it should finish in my brain. You know, before surgery, I should finish my surgery in my brain. If I couldn't finish my surgery before surgery, I should not start. <laughs> or that I have to change my uh, surgical approach also. Yeah, we have to have simulation before surgery. Brilliant. Professor uh, Erez, any other comment? Well, just uh, again, congratulating uh, Ugo Ture for this wonderful talk and wonderful teaching. Just congratulating my dear friend Salman again for a wonderful webinar and uh, the great opportunity for everybody all over the world uh, to listen to those uh, fantastic talks. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me as moderator because for me it's a great honor and, and great pleasure. Okay. Um... Um, the other thing I, I wanted uh, both uh, Miguel as well as um, Ore just to give um, our young neurosurgeons advice for future. Okay, Professor Ture. Uh, so you asked me. Uh, sorry, I, I thought that you asked uh, Miguel. Bo both of you, uh, our young neurosurgeons. Uh, what's your advice? This is a, my well, advice is to go to lab and respect the brain. Don't start to destroy the brain to go somewhere. We cannot monitor brain. 
We can monitor some functions, but it's not reliable. We cannot monitor all human functions. Brain is holy organ. Still, we don't know how is it working. We have to respect normal brain. We cannot monitor normal brain. We can maybe give some electricity to somewhere. You can have response now, but you cannot have response five minutes later. And then 10 minutes later, you may have another response. This is confusion. You, you cannot control your surgery with this electricity surgery. We have to respect normal brain. Okay. Thank you. I, I completely uh, agree with you. I think that uh, the message is, uh, of course, uh, in regard to how important going to the lab since the very beginning of your training, uh, how important is. I think this is a, a very um, crucial issue. The knowledge of neuroanatomy in any aspect of neurosurgery you want to, to be to, to be come involved uh, in. This is one question. Second question is uh, the use, uh, judicious use of technology, as uh, Professor Ture mentioned. There are many tools. We can take advantage of those possibilities. Sometimes endoscopy, of course, neural monitoring, maybe intraoperative MRI or whatever, uh, sophisticated uh, technology. But uh, taking the, into account that uh, there is a saying, uh, a fool with a tool is always a fool. So the tool is not improving your uh, possibility to do things uh, in, in the very bad way if you don't have a judicious way of uh, um, facing the case. And the important point, uh, the third important point to my mind, talking about difficult cases, deep uh, seated cases that we have seen in the, wonderful, in the wonderful presentation of Professor Ture, is the surgical indication. Surgical indication is crucial. If you do a good indication for the case, no matter what happened after, after that, Maybe you don't have a, a very good result. Uh, maybe you can feel a little disappointed, but you have done the right thing. If you have done the right thing coming from a good surgical indication, your role has been you know, uh, done and, and you have to be uh, happy about that. These are my, my three points for those uh, consideration for young neurosurgeons. I'm grateful, uh, um, uh, Miguel uh, Atul Ore. I think you know we really enjoyed the whole talk. Uh, learned loads as always that that I do with you whenever we come across each other. Uh, if everybody can switch on their video, we're just going to have a group photograph. Please switch on your videos. Thank you. Everyone, please switch on your video. Thank you very much. Quickly. Yep. Brilliant. Oh, <laughs> okay, everybody can smile, please. Professor Ture, I need your smile. <laughs> okay, are we done? Yes, sir, done. Okay, I'm grateful. Thank you, everyone. It was brilliant. Really enjoyed that. We're going to be meeting soon. As always, uh, we'll get together soon. Thank okay. you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, my friends. Bye -bye. Have a nice day, my friends.